big topic, but I'll try to fly through it and if, uh, hopefully there'll be some time for some discussion. So um, this is an overview. So we're just gonna look at the goals of inner body fusion, history, uh, some concerns surrounding uh, the techniques, um, uh, materials uh, for different implants, and then talk quickly at the end about some approaches and some uh, comparative uh, complication analysis of the different uh, uh, types of approaches for inner body fusion. So the goals overall increase fusion rates and decrease uh, disc mobility, resist uh, translational and rotational forces about the spine uh, during uh, when utilizing fusion, uh, avoid kyphotic collapse, um, decrease the uh, rate of instrumentation failure, and then increase intervertebral height. Um, this includes uh, maintaining a foraminal height, uh, and this can be uh, indirect decompression uh, technique with laterals or a lifts, and improve uh, segmental uh, stability and alignment of the spine uh, when you're looking at uh, deformity correction in particular. Uh, some, so uh, in 1944, Briggs and Milligan first described the, uh, the posterior lumbar inner body fusion or a PLIF. And it was a round peg placed in uh, a round peg of uh, bone placed in the inner body space after disc removal. Uh, 1953, Cloward uh, began using allograft for this type of procedure, and uh, uh, it still remained unpopular uh, due to uh, technical difficulties and complications through the 50s and 60s. Um, in uh, the late 90s, uh, there was a, a fair number of uh, folks that uh, started to discuss uh, the PLIF. Uh, and their results um, and started to have better outcomes. And uh, Professor Sook uh, in the late 90s uh, talked about his experience, his, uh, experience and wrote that the addition of inner body fusion uh, led to higher fusion rates, better correction of deformities, uh, better maintenance of correction and improved uh, clinical outcomes uh, when compared to posterior lateral fusion alone. Um, but there are issues with uh, inner body grafting. Uh, subsidence in particular is one. Uh, uh, subsidence um, being penetration of the inner body cage into the adjacent bones. Um, there's a number of uh, re researchers who have looked at subsidence uh, for, for all different types of inner body grafts. And um, some people have talked about uh, cage mismatch uh, between the end plate uh, and the cage morphology uh, or of the sort of the anatomy of the cage versus the end plate. Uh, people have looked at the effect of end plate destruction um, on subsidence. And then they've also looked at uh, different um, uh, types of uh, materials and sizes, sizing of the cages. This was uh, one study in particular that's more recently looked at cervical cage uh, morphology and material and, and uh, substrate density on the effect of cage morphology, or sorry, on the effect of cage uh, subsidence. And overall, they, uh, the results showed that uh, when, well, they compared a lower density foam and a higher density foam as the substrate. So to, to sort of replicate osteoporotic or more healthy bone. And uh, uh, when you look at this graph, um, the lower density foam had much higher rates of subsidence overall when compared to uh, low, uh, high density foam. And then uh, cage size also had a fairly uh, large effect on, uh, on subsidence. So the larger, the larger cages in the uh, higher density foam had better uh, uh, rates of subsidence. Uh, so materials, um, Autograft has been the gold standard. Uh, structural allograft has also been used and more, you know, more, uh, in more recently uh, synthetic cages such as peak and titanium are being used. Um, drawbacks of autograft obviously is surgical site morbidity, operative time, and limited supply of autograft. And there's drawbacks of um, other uh, cages as well in, in the synthetic arena. Um, there can be increased cost with these uh, cages. Obviously they're more expensive than autograft. And uh, when you're looking at uh, peak and other uh, materials, there can be some differences in biological activity that need to be um, uh, thought about. Uh, so for peak, uh, the advantages of peak are that it's inexpensive, radiolucent, and has a modulus of elasticity that approximates cortical bone. Um, there's some disadvantages, and we'll talk about this as well, as, as there, the, the material doesn't integrate into bone very well, and uh, there can be a fibrous, uh, layer of tissue that forms around the bone. And this can lead to pseudarthrosis and migration of the implant. Titanium, uh, it has more biologic activity, uh, promotes osteogenesis and healing of the bone onto, uh, onto the cage itself, uh, has sufficient strength in their physiologic loads. Uh, but it is uh, 
lead it can lead to increased uh, subsidence uh, secondary to higher modulus of elasticity and uh, it can also uh, be obscuring of uh, uh, your radiograph uh, radiographic evaluation of uh, not only the uh, fusion but the other areas of the bone you're trying to look at um, so there are new uh, surface treatments uh, as well as uh, 3d uh, printed um, cages uh, so surface uh, t coating of uh, peak implants with titanium uh, this can improve uh, bone formation uh, onto an integration onto the cage uh, you can maintain your uh, modulus elasticity with the peak but have better um, surface integration of the bone onto the implant but uh, there's been uh, but these implants have been also had issues um, some of them have uh, had weak surface interfaces uh, and can uh, fracture on implantation and there can be also wear debris that can uh, occur. Um, 3D printed we'll talk about, uh, but it has a, a porous uh, 3D architecture that promotes uh, not only um, in-growth and on-growth of the, of the uh, titanium implant, but uh, because of the 3D printed architecture can uh, improve the uh, um, biomechanical features of the implant as well. So just looking at uh, some sort of uh, real early work uh, when looking at titanium, uh, this was a study uh, published in uh, the early 90s, um, looking at uh, smooth versus rough textured or even porous coated uh, titanium and the, looking at the effect of osteous integration. And uh, basically they cultured osteoblasts uh, from these different uh, types of surface uh, um, titanium surfaces. And they found that osteoblasts cultured on the rough textured and porous coated titanium regions exhibited a much higher rates of bone specific extracellular matrix synthesis and subsequent mineralization compared to osteoblasts that were taken off of the uh, smooth uh, areas of the titanium. And then this is another early paper looking at the effect of uh, grit blasting of the uh, titanium surfaces and uh, showing that uh, this uh, provides much uh, higher uh, ability to resist shear forces uh, when compared to smooth uh, titanium. And um, going forward, uh, I'm just going to skip through for the sake of time so we can talk about um, some other stuff. But Porous Peak is also available, and that's um, you know uh, trying to uh, basically improve the interface um, uh, of bone into the implant. And then um, this is a paper that was published about um, the titanium, about a titanium coated implant, uh, titanium coated peak implant. And uh, they compared it to, uh, to peak alone and did show that uh, the histology, histology on their analysis showed a newly uh, formed woven bone track along the surface of the titanium into the aperture of the device. And um, the peak interface uh, presented the typical type of uh, fibrous tissue um, that you'll see, I'll, I'll show you here on this picture, excuse me. Um, but this is more of a more, a more common uh, of a peak in an implant where you have a fibrous uh, sort of a layer around the, around the bone and, uh, and the implant on histology. And uh, this is actually showing a 3D printed uh, titanium uh, implant. And we'll get to that in a second. But so uh, let me move on to 3D printed. So uh, this was a study uh, that I thought really was emblematic of uh, 3D printed technology. And they, they looked at, um, uh, compared it to peak uh, and plasma sprayed uh, porous, uh, uh, plasma sprayed peak and porous uh, coated titanium uh, peak, and then uh, looked at fusion at eight and 16 weeks. Um, I think this was a, uh, of a rabbit model. Um, and so they basically found no difference in flexion extension and lateral bending and axial compression, but the bone ingrowth and on growth with a 3D printed cage was superior to, pleat, uh, to peak and to plasma coating, uh, and then uh, led to greater stability of the implant. And then uh, peak uh, all had fibrous tissue surrounding the implant surface, but peak, uh, but the peak implants had the most. So, um, I guess we're about 640. So I'll move on to uh, the lumbar approaches, uh, different, um, we'll kind of discuss different uh, approaches for inner body fusion, risks, complication, and then we'll kind of do some compare, talk about comparative analysis of them. Uh, so there's five approaches. There's a PLIF, uh, 
a T lift, a transpyramidal lumbar interbody fusion, A lift, an anterior lumbar interbody fusion, lateral, and O lift, which is an oblique uh, lumbar interbody fusion. <clears throat> so um, Briggs and, uh, and Milligan in 1944 first described the PLIF uh, technique. And it, the rationale for it was to be able to obtain a 360 degree um, fusion of the lumbar spine uh, from a posterior approach alone and avoid an anterior access uh, to the spine. Um, indications were, uh, well, many different types of indications or lumbar degenerative pathology most commonly. And then contraindications for this technique are arachnoiditis and extensive epidural scarring. Uh, this uh, technique uh, utilizes a direct posterior approach to the disc space and uh, does require a lot of uh, retraction of the nerve roots so that that can the, that can present issues. Um, the other um, potential problems associated are if, if you have severe disc space collapse or severe ankylosis, um, access to the disc space is uh, impossible. So that can be problematic. Um, but again, the advantages are uh, full visualization of the posterior aspect of the spine, nerve roots, et cetera, and can have inner body height restoration when compared to posterior lateral fusion alone. But this has really fallen um, more so to the wayside uh, because of uh, difficulties with uh, retraction, nerve root injury, uh, et cetera. And um, I think more so, more commonly, people who are doing inner body fusion from the posterior approach are utilizing a T-lift uh, technique. Um, T lifts first described in 1982, and um, again, developed to address the issues I spoke about with nerve root uh, retraction, durotomies, uh, epidural fibrosis postoperatively. And this technique requires much less uh, nerve root retraction. Um, it can be done uh, either open, direct uh, approach, or through an MIS uh, type of approach with a Wiltsy. Uh, and same indications, um, advantages are easy access to the posterior structures preservation of the ligamentous architecture of the spine, um, less nerve root retraction, as I mentioned. But again, uh, same thing with PLIF, uh, very difficult to uh, correct a coronal imbalance uh, with this technique or and also difficult to uh, correct sagittal alignment and maintain sagittal alignment with a T-lift uh, implant. And implant preparation can be difficult. Uh, complications with PLIF and, and T-lift, um, there can be intraoperative neurologic injuries, that's about 5%, um, durotomy is 7.3%, um, and then of course, uh, subsidence is, is an issue as well, 26.5%. Um, so a number of these uh, complications can be associated with any, different, any types of uh, inner body uh, device, inner body uh, techniques, but um, let me move on. So uh, next, uh, technique for inner body fusion is the anterior lumbar inner body fusion. So this was first described in the 1930s and uh, it's an anterior retroperitoneal approach as we all know. Um, and uh, indications are uh, structural instability, uh, anterior column reconstruction uh, for spinal deformity, uh, discogenic disease or revision failed uh, posterior uh, uh, fusion. Um, contraindications for ALIF though are uh, if there's any type of adverse uh, vascular anatomy that uh, are, make it impossible or uh, significant prior abdominal surgeries with adhesions and such, uh, this can really make it um, very difficult to perform uh, this procedure. And then it's uh, more difficult to perform uh, the ALIF approach in the upper lumbar spine due to um, uh, extensive uh, retraction, uh, vascular uh, injury, or renal uh, injury. Um, advantages of the ALIF, obviously you have a direct view of the disc space and uh, access to any ventral pathology, and you can really maximize the implant size and the surface area, which can uh, achieve aggressive uh, correction of lordosis and pyramidal height restoration. So from a deformity perspective, uh, it's really great uh, technique. And from an indirect decompression technique uh, perspective, it's a very um, good approach. Uh, retrograde ejaculation uh, or visceral and vascular injury is obviously uh, an issue. Um, there, this is uh, looking at intra intraoperative and postoperative complications. Uh, vascular injury, uh, venous and arterial uh, is 4%, four, 4 and uh, 0 to 1% for arterial injuries intraoperatively. But there can be uh, other issues, and um, retrograde ejaculation being one of them uh, due to the injury to the sympathetic chain. <clears throat> 
post-operative complications um, can be uh, proximal DVTs can occur, uh, and there and there is a not insignificant risk for ileus um, uh, in these patients as well. Uh, the uh, lateral uh, lumbar inner body fusion, uh, its lateral retroperitoneal approach can be a trans-psoas or now newly, uh, more, more recently described uh, anti-psoas uh, or oblique, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this avoids the, uh, uh, you know, it does offer the benefits of minimally invasive surgery, but avoids the uh, um, issues uh, with anterior uh, lumbar inner, uh, fusion uh, with uh, going through the abdomen. Um, and uh, let me just keep moving so we have time. Same indications, uh, advantages of lateral, uh, minimally invasive uh, approach. It allows for a rapid mobilization of the patients and can also offer uh, aggressive deformity correction. Um, and when you, um, even in cases where a, a large amount of deformity uh, correction is uh, required, uh, anterior column uh, realignment uh, can be utilized. Um, there, there are disadvantages and there's, it's not as commonly utilized among spine surgeons because there is a relatively steep learning curve and a difficult orientation of the anatomy, risk of injury to the lumbar plexus, and uh, there can be a, a lower, much lower incidence of vascular or bowel injury, but not, not uh, zero. And then L5S1 is difficult to access from this approach. Um, I'm going to keep moving on here. So for the sake of time, um, OLIF is, a, is an anti-SOAS approach. Uh, it doesn't require uh, posterior dissection. Uh, there's no SOAS dissection, and it's also minimally invasive. Um, let me go to complications. So looking at different uh, complication profiles for these uh, approaches, um, this was an interesting, uh, more recent paper. Dr. Walker, one of the former fellows, published um, looking at psoas and anti-psoas uh, approaches uh, to the spine, and I thought it really kind of highlighted the uh, overall uh, complication profiles for both of these uh, techniques. Um, they had about 2,000 patients almost in the uh, in the pre-psoas approach, and uh, and about 4,600 in the in the uh, trans-psoas, more traditional uh, lateral approach. In the trans-psoas ap approach, there was a, a higher rate of transient neurologic uh, symptoms, 21% sensory, so that's not uh, insignificant, and 8% uh, in the in the anti-psoas approach. Um, transient hip flexor weakness was 20%, and anti-psoas was 5.7%. Uh, permanent neurologic weakness was 2.8% and 1% in the uh, in the anti-psoas. So uh, these are sort of good to know, good to have on hand when you're thinking about doing um, lateral access surgery. Um, of the non-neurologic complications, major vascular injury was much higher in the, or significantly higher in the, in the pre-SOAS uh, technique, which was 1.8%. And we don't really get into much vascular injury in the lateral, uh, in the straight uh, trans approach, thankfully. Um, no difference in neurologic or peritoneal or bowel injuries or bilious, et cetera. Um, with respect to fusion outcomes, they were all similar with the, with the, and, uh, between the two approaches um, for fusion and subsidence rates and pseudoarthrosis rates. Um, this is looking at ALIF versus TLIF. Um, this was a meta-analysis really, and looked at um, basically with fusion rates, there was no, no uh, uh, significant difference. Vascular injuries higher with ALIF, neurologic deficits, no, no difference, infection, no difference. Um, but I would argue that when so a lot of these papers and these meta-analysis don't look at um, deformity um, parameters uh, as closely um, in terms of uh, overall restoration of segmental or dosis, et cetera. Um, this was a comparison of lateral versus uh, all the other techniques. Um, there were uh, inner body, uh, excuse me, the radiographic outcomes were inner body uh, fusion, uh, looking at increased uh, segmental or dosis. ALIF had a decrease uh, in superior adjacent lordosis. Lateral was superior for disc height restoration. And ALIF uh, did show the overall greatest amount of segmental and overall lumbar lordosis correction. Um, this paper, uh, as I alluded to before, is looking at more segmental alignment. Watkins et al. published this in 2014, looked at uh, 220 consecutive patients and 300 levels uh, performed. And, Lordosis improvement and disc height uh, improvement was significant in the ALIF and lateral groups, but not the TLIF group. And ALIF was, uh, was improved compared to the other two with regard to lordosis. 
um, all three groups were able to reduce, uh, to, were able to adequately reduce a, a spondylolisthesis. But I think this highlights the um, the uh, ability of lateral and, and anterior lumbar interbody fusion to achieve uh, segmental uh, lordosis and deformity correction. So I think I ended uh, mostly on time. Um, I think overall, uh, you know, we have limited comparative evidence to, to show that one uh, technique is really superior to the other with respect to fusion and clinical outcomes. But I think that the evidence uh, is pretty strong uh, to support um, segmental lordosis uh, and, uh, and deformity uh, correction um, is improved with lateral and anterior approaches. Um, technology continues to advance um, with respect to interbody cage surface architecture, uh, nanotechnology, um, as well as with approaches and MIS techniques and retractor systems that are constantly being um, sort of improved upon and, and uh, um, uh, getting, getting us better access to the spine. And um, so that's, that's pretty much it. I, I really uh, appreciate your time and uh, love to open it up for discussion. Thanks, Rob. Nice job. Anybody else chiming in? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Hey, man, good job. Uh, like, you know, one of the things that I think has gotten uh, some attention is like the basic science behind um, uh, peak versus the, like some of the, type, the material sciences that you talked about, you know. Like when you go into practice, what like what's your what's your thought? What are you what are you gonna do? Are you gonna use yeah. peak or you use titanium or you gonna use three D printed? What what's, what's gonna be your decision making after you do this talk? How, how's it gonna change what you do? Yeah, I think that um, obviously, like we're all a, we're all um, you know a function of where we where we train and you know the the techniques and the uh, teachings that we are surrounded by and make a huge impact on our decision making. And I think that um, at our practice, I mean, the, the good thing about it is like, you know, we're actually looking at this from a, from a research uh, based standpoint, you know, not just kind of going along with the, the flow. We're actually trying to, trying to prove uh, the things that we kind of hang our hat on clinically. So in terms of 3d printed titanium, I think it's a great option. I, I you know, I was at um, uh, a, a lab over the, this past week and kind of looked at a lot of different um, surface technologies for different graphs and different materials. And, you know, I think that for peak, uh, for me, it, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense anymore when you have um, technology out there uh, with, uh, you know, titanium coated, uh, or 3D printed titanium um, in particular, uh, there seems to be a, a, enough evidence to support um, the biomechanical evidence and, and, and histology evidence uh, to support 3D printed tie as, as kind of, in my opinion, the better of, uh, of, of, of the materials uh, at this point in time. Um, there are implants that are titanium coated peak that I think also offer um, a, a good, a good option. Obviously, um, we tend to use that quite a bit in the cervical spine here. And I think that it, it's been, uh, as far as what I've seen since I've been here, it's been pretty successful. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of different options out there. And, um, but in my opinion, I think 3d printed technology is probably where we're, where I'm headed to in my practice. Um, Rob, why is that again? Why is that? Well, I, I think that when you're looking at the ingrowth of the bone into the implant and the 3D print, the 3D lattice structure, you're uh, getting a lot of, uh, uh, you're getting better ingrowth of the of the um, bone into the into the device itself, and uh, ingrowth and. And you know that growth. based on you know that based on plane radiographic outcomes, CT outcome. How do you know? Well, that? well, I'm taking the biomechanical and histology. Uh, data and translating it uh, mm -hmm. clinically. And we have okay. obviously the, the clinical data is not there yet to, to really support that. But from the standpoint of um, looking at the, at the preclinical uh, 
uh, information that we have available to us, it certainly is fairly uh, compelling. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 this slide in particular is a histology slide from from a three D looking at a three D printed uh, titanium device versus a peak. And when you show that and you see the amount of fib fibrous uh, material around the peak uh, cage versus right. the amount of ingrowth into the into the three D printed lattice structure of the of the implant, that's that's fairly compelling. And, yeah, right. and I'm not, and I'm obviously they're looking at, you know, you guys are looking at modulus, uh, 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 the fusion uh, st uh, studies and, and doing all the clinical work. And that's not out, that's not really robust yet. In, in the, I've, I tried to find clinical uh, papers on 3D printed cages and there's not yeah. a lot out there. And yeah, so right. all you can do is go off of, uh, you know, combining what you've been taught and what you've learned and looking at this preclinical stuff and, sort of take it um, and go from there. I, yeah. I, I still, yeah, for me personally, I, I the, the modulus of peak and the on growth in growth capability of titanium being married plus the radio lucency of the peak as we do in our cervical cages. For me, at least, I think that seems to fix the problem with plain peak for me in a way that I still worry about the stiffness of even a 3D, 3D printed titanium cage compared to a peak cage, what that impact has on the bone itself. I, I'm not sure if there's a clinical outcome difference. I agree with you, you know, radiographic outcome difference. Um, perhaps there's a more rapid, you know, on growth capability with the 3D printed titaniums that I'm not, I, I haven't been using those. So I don't know. Just asking well, the question from what you gleaned. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that we didn't discuss too much is just the uh, imaging artifact. So in, in my practice, in the lumbar spine, it's not as much of an issue, but I did use some 3D printed tie in the cervical spine for a while. And, it, you know, even regardless of how well they tout, you know, their imaging artifact, it, it's still an issue. And so yeah, that's why and, I prefer the tie coated peak in the cervical spine. And I'm going to chime in for the same reason. So when I look at CTs on the 3D printed tie at, at a year, which I've looked at, I still struggle to confirm that there has been growth of bone enough so that there, I would consider something truly a solid fusion. Now, is that clinical re clinically relevant? I have no idea. So I struggle because of the artifact issue as Hanny points out, because it just obscures some of the bone growth depending on the density of the titanium and so on and so forth. And so I think we're still, I think you're right. I think you're right. We're, the, the trend towards changing the, surface changing the geometry of the implant changing the on growth and growth capability of the implant are pushing us to better outcomes i think that's the key thing for me i think we're making these things better yeah and i mean the one takeaway i think is you can make your argument for a lot of different surfaces but mm -hmm. it's hard to argue for smooth peak you know unless there's some compelling reason yeah i'm gonna be i'm gonna be a little bit of a naysayer i'm not sure we're improving outcomes we haven't proven that yet. Yeah, we haven't proven that. We may be. I said, like, we, I remember we, I said, I think we are. Right. I said, I think we are. You're right, Bob. But, you know, the, yeah. the, the ACDF allograph crew would argue that they're, that we're a lot more yeah. expensive yeah, and for no would. additional clinical benefit. Yeah. So we you're, stopped exactly right. these things. You're exactly right. 